Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired software engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today, we're going to answer a deceptively simple question, one that has shaped 20 years of desktop and server computing. How did AMD manage to leapfrog Intel using Intel's own instruction set? It's the x64 story, but with a plot twist. Because for a decade, everyone's hopes were pinned on Itanium, the gleaming, very long instruction word future. And just about the time that the orchestra swelled for its triumphant entrance, the Itanium missed its cue. AMD, the scrappy underdog from Sunnyvale, was already in the wings with x86-64, and when the baton slipped, they caught it in stride and never looked back. If you were on the Windows side when Dave Cutler's team brought x64 into NT, you saw the whole thing unfold from the kernel on outwards. If you glanced at Task Manager on those early x64 builds, you might have noticed a little tiny asterisk that told a big story. But first, let's rewind to set the stage. By the late 1990s, 32-bit x86 had become a hugely successful accident of history. It started life in the late 70s as the 8086, hardly designed for the gigantic threaded graphical multitasking worlds we'd eventually build. But x86 was everywhere cheap and compatible with the mountains of software that the world already relied on. That compatibility was both its superpower and its shackle. A lot of people, some very smart ones, concluded that we'd eventually need to break out of the backward compatibility prison and start fresh. So Intel and HP did exactly that with Itanium, betting on EPIC, explicitly parallel instruction computing. In EPIC, the compiler took on the burden of scheduling the instruction stream statically, bundling operations and predicting resource hazards ahead of time. In theory, it would unlock incredible parallelism by extracting the last bits of instruction-level parallelism from your code. In practice, the compilers had to be near-omniscient, the binary ecosystem had to be rebuilt, and real-world performance wound up coming in somewhere between underwhelming and mortifying, especially if you were running existing x86 code under emulation. Now, the thing about revolutions is that you have to bring the entire city along. The plumbers, the bakers, the street sweepers, all the shops, and all the signage. Intel's revolution swapped out the language of the city, the alphabet on the street signs, and then asked every store owner to repaint their awnings by Tuesday. And while a few storefronts that did switch sometimes found Itanium ran like a scalded cat on certain HPC kernels that the compilers could schedule cleanly, the rest of the city mostly stayed put. Microsoft produced an Itanium build of Windows, SQL Server, the whole bit. But the gravitational pull of compatibility remained enormous. Because the real world is messy. Drivers, legacy apps, software that was never really portable, and entire business processes welded to a specific ABI that all refused to move as one. And that's exactly where AMD saw the seam in its universe. Instead of overthrowing x86, they embraced and extended it. The design goal for their x8664, which AMD later branded as AMD64, was quietly radical. Keep the programming model familiar enough that OS vendors and compilers could come along with moderate work, yet fix the architectural sins that throttled 32-bit performance and addressing. You could run 32-bit code essentially unmodified on a 64-bit operating system because the hardware provided compatibility mode under the umbrella of long mode. User mode 32-bit apps could use their same old instruction set then call into the 64-bit kernel through a thin WoW 64 veneer. Meanwhile, for native 64-bit processes, you got a cleaned-up programming model with the rough edges of 1980s segmentation quietly swept away. In long mode, segmentation is effectively gone. FS and GS remain as base registers for thread local storage, but the rest of the old segment arithmetic that made compiler writers reach for their aspirin was finally retired. That alone simplified a mountain of code generation and runtime complexity. AMD also added what the 32-bit x86 really starved for, more general purpose registers. I mean, I grew up on 6502, which has one accumulator and two 8-bit index registers, so 8 always felt like a lot to me, but compiler authors did not agree. The original 8, which are EAX through EDI with ESP and EBP as stack and frame pointers, were never enough for the modern compilers. Every time the register allocator ran out of registers, it had to spill variables onto the stack, and that's death by a thousand cache misses. AMD64 gives you 16 full 64-bit general purpose registers, RAX through RA15, plus 16 XMM registers baselined by Fiat because SSE2 is mandatory in 64-bit mode. The extra registers turned out to be profoundly important. A lot of code gets faster 64-bit not because it suddenly needs 64-bit pointers, but because the compiler finally has register breathing room and a saner calling convention. And about those pointers, AMD's designers were conservative in the best sense. 
Rather than flipping the entire virtual address range from 32 bits to a full 64, they defined canonical addresses and initially only used the low 48 bits of virtual addresses, sign extended through the upper bits. That made page table structures tractable, four levels of paging with PML4 at the top, and left room for future expansion. Physical address width also grew modestly at first. The idea was that OS vendors shouldn't have to re-engineer every allocator and metadata structure in the kernel to handle 64 bits everywhere overnight. Instead, they could move deliberately, picking up the right 64-bit types for the paths that needed them and keeping structures tight elsewhere. Two other surgical fixes speak to the elegance of the design. First, AMD introduced RIP relative addressing. Because on 32-bit x86, position-independent code was a contortion act. You wound up loading addresses into registers and indexing through them. With RIP relative addressing, code can refer to nearby data using offsets from the instruction pointer. That simplified loaders, made shared libraries cleaner, and reduced fix-ups. Intel had introduced SysEnter and SysExit initially on the 32-bit chips, and on X64, AMD's SysCall pair became the clean, fast path. And you get it every time that you call into the OS. Meanwhile, back on the farm, let's check in on Microsoft. Inside NT, moving the kernel to a new architecture is never trivial, but AMD had made it feel like upgrading a house rather than pouring a new foundation from scratch. The memory management layer had to learn 64-bit page tables, but the abstractions were still familiar. The trap handlers were rewritten for the new calling conventions in the syscall path, but the kernel's responsibilities, scheduling, I.O., memory management, didn't suddenly change under the new system. WoW 64 could host 32-bit user land in a set of 32-bit NTDLL and system DLLs living beside the 64-bit world. Thunking was narrow and mechanical, not a crazy research project. Drivers were the sore point, though, because you can't load a 32-bit driver into a 64-bit kernel any more than you can bolt a lawnmower carburetor onto a jet engine. So the device ecosystem had to be rebuilt. But the NTDDK did what it's always done. It put a stable facade over the guts, so most authors were able to just port or recompile rather than rewrite. Because Task Manager had always done its internal accounting using full 64-bit types, never assuming, for example, that PIDs fit in this many bits or that memory counters would forever be 32 bits, it just worked when recompiled for x64. The only visible change was cosmetic. Dave C. added an asterisk to the process column to mark 64-bit processes. And under the hood, it actually got a lot faster, not because a process list suddenly needs 16 exabytes of address space, but because the 64-bit calling convention passes arguments and registers and the compiler has room to keep hot variables out of the stack. The best porting stories are like that. The light comes on and the counters spin just the same as always, but quicker. Let's talk calling conventions a bit, because this is where AMD's keep it familiar but better philosophy really paid off. On Win32, you lived the world of standard call and fast call flavors and almost everything passed on the stack. On Win64, Windows standardized a single convention. The first four integer or pointer parameters go in RCX, RDX, R8, and R9. Floating point arguments track in XMM0 through 3, and the caller reserves a 32-byte shadow space on the stack for the callee to spill there if they need it. Call-E saved registers are RBX, RBP, RSAI, RDI, and R12 through 15, which gave the compiler a broader register file and predictable unwind semantics. Structured exception handling switched to table-based unwinds with precise metadata, and because x64 mandated SSC2, nobody had to juggle the ancient x87 stack for floating point, except if you were interacting with old code. You can trace significant chunks of the performance boost in boring server workloads directly to those types of decisions. And while we're in the weeds a little bit here, let's take a look at the memory protection story. AMD wired in the NX bit, or the no execute bit, as a first class citizen in the page tables. Intel later adopted it as XD. Windows turned that into DEP, Data Execution Prevention, long before write with execute disabled became cocktail chatter. AMD 64 plus DEP plus ASLR moved the needle on exploit resistance in a very real way. Some of the most impactful security improvements of the mid-2000s were unlocked by the new ISA's page table semantics as much as by any special kernel hardening. If you want to see how architecture becomes strategy, compare the AMD 64's approach with Itanium's. With IA64, the compiler is king. You recompile everything for the new world and let the optimizer discover the parallelism explicitly. With AMD 64, the microarchitecture is the plumber. You leave most of the instruction set architecture semantics alone and make the pipes bigger and straighter. The really cool twist is that the microarchitectural part of AMD's bet paid off twice. 
First, the K8 Hammer cores that shipped in Opteron and Athlon 64 were just flat out good CPUs. And they had an integrated memory controller so you didn't pay the penalty of a frontside bus hop to fetch every cache line. They used hypertransport rather than a shared frontside bus so multi-socket Opteron scaled pretty elegantly. And the pipeline wasn't just the heat-soaked spaghetti factory that Intel's Prescott netburst eventually became. When Intel aimed for 10 GHz by stretching the pipeline and shrinking the useful work in each cycle, they drifted into a thermal cul-de-sac. AMD stayed tight and fast, so when Windows Server and SQL Server compiled clean for the AMD64, the platform delivered honest-to-goodness throughput. Second, the AMD64 instruction set itself gave compilers the elbow room that they'd always wanted. Recompile your middleware as x64 and... You saw gains even if your data structures didn't grow simply because spilling went down, inlining got smarter, and the register allocator stopped living in constant debt. Meanwhile, the OS team at Microsoft could push out a 64-bit Windows that didn't strand the application ecosystem. WoW 64 is a neat example of AMD's design enabling a clean system. In long mode, the CPU executes 32-bit user code in compatibility mode while the kernel stays 64-bit. The transitions through NTDLL and the system call stubs take on the necessary gymnastics so that, from the app's perspective, it's just making the same Win32 calls that it always did, and the kernel never stops being a 64-bit citizen. That's also why you wind up with SysWow64 containing 32-bit binaries and System32 containing 64-bit binaries. The naming stayed backward looking for compatibility reasons because that's where people looked for those files. The contents flipped, though. File system register redirection kept old installers from scribbling on the wrong hives. The price you paid was that 32-bit drivers were persona non grata, and 16-bit apps finally saw the sun go down. See you later, machinist friend. Pour one on the curb. But the smoothness of the port brought Microsoft enough political capital to enforce two big quality levers on x64, driver signing and patch guard, which is kernel patch protection. And those weren't just incidental. The platform shift was strong enough that Redmond could come along and say, hey, new world, new rules. From a developer's chair, moving code from 32 bits to 64 bits kind of fell into two buckets. If you're living in user land and your code was well-behaved, I mean, you used size T when you meant pointer size quantity and stuff, and D word for 32-bit integers when you meant 32-bit integers, and you didn't smuggle pointers through your longs and stuff, then your worst days were about format strings and structure padding with printf needing percent %p instead of percent %08x for pointers and stuff like that. You found out that time t or size t had grown if you look behind the scenes, and your custom memory allocator needs to think in terms of real size of pointers and alignment, if you were into that. The compilers helped a lot because warnings about truncation and sign extension went from that's cute in the old days to fix it or this won't link. A sloppy code base that had muddled the distinction between integer widths and pointer widths learned humility quickly. Kernel mode was its own little amphitheater. ERPs, MDLs, and the memory manager's data structures picked up the 64-bit pointers. DMA code had to understand devices that could only address 32 bits of physical space. IOCTAL packing had to marshal 32-bit user buffers correctly. But none of it required new mathematics, just discipline. There were also a few pleasant surprises. Because the x64 calling convention moved the first four parameters into registers, certain hot abstractions got noticeably cheaper. Function pointer callbacks, COM V tables, and even your basic C object calls saw their overhead shrink. RIP relative addressing made position independent code, and therefore DLL code, cleaner. And with the SSE2 baseline, your vector math could finally assume a modern floating point substrate. That's partly why even GUI infrastructure like GDI and User32 felt sprightlier in native 64 bit builds. Even things like Task Manager got a little faster because when you remove unnecessary spills and stack traffic, even aggressively optimized utilities get out of their own way. Meanwhile, out in the real world of the market, the baton handoff was happening in public. In 2003, AMD shipped Opteron and then Athlon 64. Microsoft shipped Windows Server on AMD 64 and, not much later, Windows XP Professional X64 Edition. ISVs started doing the math and decided they could ship a 64-bit build and keep their 32-bit binary for customers still on the old hardware. And then came the moment that cemented the plot twist. Intel adopted AMD 64-bit extensions. And they tried to call it EM64T for a while and then Intel 64, but the die was cast. It was x86-64, that was the new lingua franca. And when your rivals adopt your instruction set architecture, you haven't just won a technical argument. You've redrawn the map. Now, people on lesser channels would simplify this as AMD beat Intel because Intel bet on Itanium and Itanium dumb. But that leaves out half the truth. AMD didn't just get lucky that Itanium stumbled. 
They engineered an extension to x86 that was so compatible, so practical, and so strategically timed that the OS and compiler vendors could make it real without burning down the world. Yes, Itanium's compiler-driven Epic Vision proved brittle, but AMD 64's success depended on a thousand careful paper cuts. Mandate SSA2, so the floating point story is sane. Add registers so compilers stop thrashing. Remove segmentation to simplify code generation. Preserve a flat model supporting is viable. Wire in the no execute and depth bits so ops teams can sell security and bake a system call path in that lets the kernel breathe. K8's microarchitecture then turned all of that potential into performance at a time when NetBurst was just melting clocks for breakfast. One of Dave Cutler's imprints on Windows has always been about ruthlessly clear abstractions and discipline at the edges. They don't lie about sizes, they don't pretend a 32-bit quantity and an address are the same thing, they don't let calling conventions metastasize, and they try to keep the kernel small, testable, and hostile to undefined behavior. Those principles turned out to be the perfect attitude for a 64-bit transition. Windows type system, size T, U-long pointer, and the split of the integer widths wasn't just pedantry. It was laying the lane markers for this exact day. That's why when someone like you reports that task matter just worked and only picked up an asterisk to be native 64 bits, I smile because that's what careful engineering looks like from the outside. Sometimes it doesn't look like anything at all because it just works. There's another little piece of the story that's kind of fun in retrospect. For years on 32-bit windows, the address space was basically split. 2 gigabytes went to the user space and 2 gigabytes went to the kernel. And later you could change that to 3 gigabits for certain server apps. And it was a constant negotiation. Large address aware flags, AWE, PAE, and a thousand creative schemes were used to stuff ever larger data sets into a 32-bit virtual address space that was never designed for them. On x64, the grunt work falls away. User mode starts in a virtual address universe so enormous that the constraints shift from how do I map it to how do I keep my caches happy with it. Kernel pools get elbow room, and file system caches stop worrying about starving other callers. Memory mapped I.O. for modern PCIe devices has room to breathe. The sense of relief was palpable among server developers. The thing you fought all day just became a non-problem, is how you often looked at it. You can draw a straight line from AMD catching that baton to the platform norms that we now take for granted. We moved to a security posture of no execute and meaningful ASLR because the hardware gave the OS clean primitives. We standardized on a single modern calling convention and we mandated a floating point substrate that every compiler could count on. We saw operating system vendors, and not just Microsoft, enforce stronger driver quality gates because coming along with the disruption of an entirely new architecture, they finally could. They had the chance. And when Intel eventually abandoned NetBurst, embraced Core, and then rolled in their own excellent microarchitectures, the war returned to where it belongs. Cores, caches, fabrics, and efficiency on the same shared ISA that AMD had made inevitable. If you want a cautionary epilogue, think about all the designs that never quite ship because they're technically pure but operationally impossible. Itanium wasn't wrong so much as it was incompatible with the way real software is built and deployed. AMD 64 wasn't perfect, nothing is, but it respects the entanglements of the world as it is. The payoff for that humility was that Microsoft could bring forward NT without a scorched earth rewrite and your tools team could switch Visual C++ to target x64 without rewriting half the optimizer and your full friend task manager could just flip the compiler switch, pick up a star and go home early that day. So how did AMD leapfrog Intel using Intel's own instruction set? By refusing to fight the last war. They quietly rebuilt the road while everybody else was planning a new city. They added width where it mattered, removed historical friction, and kept the contract with all the software that already existed. When Itanium stumbled, AMD64 didn't have to run. It was already there, tested, tool-chained, and delivering throughput. Intel's eventual adoption of x86-64 sealed the deal, but the leapfrog had already happened. The moral for engineers is the same one Cutler taught by example. Don't confuse elegance with utility. Design in ways that let reality say yes, and you might just find the market handing you the baton when it counts. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. Make sure you're subscribed. I'll see you next time.